On May 3rd, a group of three British mountaineers, Steve Ball, Anthony Hollingshead, and Nigel Vardy, arrived at the Cahiltna Base Camp located on the Cahiltna Glacier in Alaska at an elevation of 2,195 meters. The trio aimed to climb Mount McKinley, also known as Denali. It is the highest peak in North America and known for its dangerous conditions, including extreme weather patterns. Despite these hazards, thousands of climbers still attempt to climb the peak. The mountain features a range of glaciers, including the Cahiltna Glacier, which is the longest at 71 kilometers and is also home to various species of wildlife such as grizzly bears, moose, wolves, caribou, and doll sheep. The three British climbers got stuck on America's highest mountain when the weather turned against them. One of them had to make a difficult decision, stay with his friends and freeze to death, or go down the mountain alone and risk his own life to try to save them all. Bill, Vardy, and Hollingshead were all seasoned mountaineers. Because they were experienced enough, the climbing plan should succeed without any problems. The group had chosen the difficult West Rib route on Mount McKinley, a challenging route involving navigating through rocky and icy terrain. It took about 17 days to reach high camp at about 4,846 meters. Following the expedition method, they carried their equipment to higher altitudes and descended to lower altitudes to rest. They had acclimatized well before their attempt to the summit, but it was a risk. As experienced mountaineers, they knew if they were overtaken by a storm, they would be in great difficulty. But a lightweight ascent offered the advantage of speed, which if everything went well, would allow them to race to the summit and off the mountain, reducing the danger of being caught by a storm. Their entire plan was actually based on a gamble that could also turn out wrong. At 8 a.m. on May 19th, the trio began their climb from West Rib High Camp. They made progress through the rocks and climbed up the left couloir, which was one of the two prominent couloirs on that route. At 5.30 p.m., the group encountered Jack Tackle at an altitude of 5,700 meters, an independent climber who was making a day climb from camp at 4,300 meters and wanted to acclimate to this altitude. He talked to the group for about 30 minutes and noted that they had no overnight gear with them. The order of climbers were Ball, Hollingshead, and Vardy. Tackle also noticed that Ball had lost a glove, and they climbed too far to the right in the couloir, climbing steeper terrain than necessary. Tackle said the weather was calm at their location, but it was blowing hard from the plateau at the summit. After an hour and a half, he returned to his camp at 4,300 meters and saw through binoculars that the group had advanced only a few rope lengths. The weather worsened, and a visible lenticular cloud formed over the top of the mountain. That evening, Tackle shared his concerns about the group with Ranger Kevin Moore. At 10 p.m., upon reaching the summit plateau, the group realized that their water bottles had frozen, and they were unable to rehydrate themselves as they had not carried a stove and pan. The cloudy weather conditions obstructed their view, so they relied on the compass to make their way towards the summit. Their best option was to keep going. They needed to reach the summit, then descend by Denali's easiest route along a ledge that led down from Denali Gap, a wide saddle below the summit. As they ascended higher, the southern summit kept disappearing in and out of the clouds. On May 20th, just after midnight, the group decided to take a break in a small crevasse on the southeast side of the plateau, estimated to be about 91 to 122 meters below the summit. They were all completely exhausted. Vardy's eye was swollen due to the current freezing of an area previously burned by the sun. Ball, on the other hand, was shivering from hypothermia during their rest attempt, and none of them could sleep. The strong wind and snow began to irritate the climbers more and more, especially Vardy, who nearly went blind from frostbite caused by the wind. Concerned about his safety, they decided to descend. As they descended, Vardy's condition worsened. Suddenly, he stumbled and dragged his companions into a 90-meter fall before Ball and Hollings had managed to use their ice axes to stop their fall. At that point, the men realized that self-rescue was not possible. Vardy was unable to continue, and Hollings had had injured his shoulder during the fall. With temperatures dropping to minus 30 degrees Celsius, they finally called for help. The team sent out a distress signal, Mayday, which was received by Tim Stageberg at the Cahiltna base camp. Stageberg informed National Park Service Ranger Meg Perdue about the British group's request for a rescue due to an injured member who couldn't ascend. Due to weak battery power, the group responded to Perdue's communication with one or two clicks of their radio, indicating yes or no to her series of questions. Ball was physically the strongest member to descend alone to search for help, 
Vardy and Hollinshead stayed at their location. Ball had come up with a plan. He would continue below the summit to the west buttress route, which was relatively less challenging. Then he would descend and head for the ranger station on the mountain's glaciers to ask for help. What the team didn't know was that the park rangers had begun the search and rescue operation early on Thursday morning, May 20th, when they received a mayday call via radio from the trio. The radio's battery was dying, and all that rangers heard was that the climbers were injured and above the 5,791.2 meters level. Although this information wasn't particularly helpful in reducing the search area, having knowledge of the climber's itinerary had somewhat simplified the rescue mission for the rangers. Rescuers on the mountain tried to find the climbers, but high winds and blizzard conditions, as is custom in the region, precluded an aerial search for most of Thursday, which meant that the three of them were still out there somewhere in the blistering cold. With diminishing supplies and an injured climber, the rangers knew that they would have to act quickly if they wanted to have a chance at getting all three of them out alive. While the attempts at rescue were futile, Rangers were able to use their helicopter to drop a cache of emergency supplies, including a new radio to contact, to the spot where they believed the climbers were located. It wasn't much, but they needed to exploit every shot they had of saving the climbers. After using the new radios, the British climbers were successfully contacted. It was determined that Vardy's condition was the most serious, as he suffered a frozen face and hands and significant loss of coordination. Hollingshead reported that the fall also left him with frostbite on his hands and a bruised right shoulder. Later, the National Park Service received information that Ball had separated from the group at 1.30 p.m. and planned to descend the West Buttress route. During radio contact, it was decided to short-haul the two climbers using a screamer suit. They were given a brief instruction on the procedures of short-hauling. Hollingshead placed the screamer suit on Vardy and then hooked him to the god ring hanging from the 100-foot rope attached to the NPS Llama helicopter. When the weather cleared, a lightweight Llama helicopter was dispatched to search for Vardy and Hollingshead in the frigid conditions. Shortly before midnight, the helicopter found the two climbers in urgent need of medical attention. They were immediately rescued and received medical treatment for their injuries. On Thursday evening, May 20th at 11.23 p.m., Vardy was safely dropped off at base camp on the glacier after a short five-minute trip from 5,944 meters. Hollingshead was similarly picked up just after midnight and flown to base camp. Then, Hudson flew them to Talkeetna, where an air ambulance from Lifeguard took them to the Providence Medical Center in Anchorage. During the evening of May 20th, there were no climbers camped at the 5,242-meter level of the West Buttress Route. The next morning on May 21st, Several private climbers departed from 4,328 meters for high camp, and Ranger Kevin Moore alerted them to look for Steve Ball, who intended to descend the route to get help for his team. Since Ball had not been seen on the lower slopes by morning, concerns began to arise at the ranger station and the aerial search was intensified. Around 1 p.m., the weather threatened to deteriorate. Suddenly, a ground team saw a figure in the snow below Denali Pass. It was Ball. Within 10 minutes, the rescue team was on the location. Over the radio, they reported that it was indeed Ball. He was conscious, but severely hypothermic. He also had an open fracture of his left tibia and fibula. A ranger named Billy Schott was lowered on a 30-meter rope from the helicopter to reach Steve Ball. The helicopter passed over the injured man, and Mr. Schott was lowered down. After placing Ball on a stretcher and wrapping him in a cover, he was tied to the rope and airlifted to safety by the helicopter. They returned to base camp at 5.17 p.m. An Air Force Pavehawk transported Ball to Providence Medical Center. According to John Quinley, spokesman for Denali National Park, he had been up there on his own for 28 hours, without any water and with no way of keeping warm. The team was trying to reach him but could find no good place to land. We decided we had to get him off the mountain. If we had been unsuccessful, we would have sent in a team and made sure he was protected in a tent, but he needed hospital care. A hospital spokesman who treated Ball said, his hands, arms, nose, feet, and legs all have severe frostbite, and the injury to his leg is an open fracture, so there is the potential for infection. You can't clearly tell where the divide is between the healthy tissue and the frostbite tissue that is not going to recover. As Ball was treated for his injuries, Hollingshead described how he and Vardy had dug a snow cave to survive the sub-zero gale force winds. Both said they were disappointed at not reaching the top, but added that the weather worked against them. 
Hollingshead recounted in a statement, we were a gnat's whisker away, but it was a combination of a lot of things. It would have been a worse situation if we had continued on. Speaking from his hospital bed, he described the weather on the mountain as the worst he had ever encountered. We managed to get somewhere out of the wind in a hole in the ice. We climbed in and then built a snow wall around ourselves. While Ball suffered the most pain because he chose to be the hero. Sometimes you have to do what's right, even if you know it might not always be right. He faced the dangerous descent and took his chances. He had been stranded, injured, and alone for 28 hours after the rescue of his two climbing companions. Despite everything, the news of Steve Ball's survival with only frostbite to his extremities was a great relief for those who had heard about the tragedy. Making the decision to descend the treacherous climb in search of help was a brave and difficult choice, and not many would have been willing to take the risk that Ball did. Though the chances of his success were slim, he did everything he could to save the lives of his fellow climbers. For this reason, he is considered a hero in the mountaineering community and a source of inspiration for many. Based on this story about three British climbers, this movie was made, I Shouldn't Be Alive, Frozen at 20,000 Feet. Thanks for watching this story. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on your notification bell to stay updated on more similar videos. We would love to hear your thoughts, so feel free to share your comments below. Until next time.